so I think there's a, uh, a foundational thought that we need to keep in the back of our minds as we go forth today. And that is, you cannot use physical means against a spiritual force. It's impossible. Uh, the story about the man of the Gadarenes, and uh, I believe it's Mark 5, when Jesus and his disciples come upon the coast and they come against this man of the Gadarenes, it says that the, um, the townspeople tried to chain him down because he, he acted crazy, right? And it says that he continually broke his chains. Well, the reason why it didn't work, because they tried to use a physical means, the chains, to come against a spiritual force, which was demonic. And so when we look at Revelation today, chapter 9, concerning the fifth trumpet, this is what we're going to see. I believe in these end times we're going to really begin to see how people will use a physical means to try to come against a spiritual force. And even in your own life right now, before we dive into this, I want you to think about some things that you might be coming against. And and sometimes some of those things you will not overcome until you realize those things in your life is a spiritual force against you and not a physical force. And it's only through the Lord that we are um, victorious. Amen. So I have a lot, guys, I got to give you. I feel that we have to get all the way through the uh, the fifth trumpet today. Uh, And again, we're going to flow pretty quickly. You have the handout before you. Um, I'm going to make some changes as we go along. But anyway, um, I'm gonna, I got to stick with it at the end. I got some pretty eerie revelation to bring forth uh, concerning where we are. Because when we read this fifth trumpet, I've, I've really struggled. I've been in this thing for a couple of weeks now, trying to figure this thing out. And uh, just this morning, the Lord gave me something that just really helped me focus back on. Uh, when we read this, it's going to sound like this is sci-fi stuff. Now, I'll just be honest with you. You hear about some of this stuff, and you're like, I don't even understand it. This seems sci-fi. It seems like a, a movie we're reading about. But at the end of this teaching, I think you're going to see how much more in reality this really is. So, without further ado, let's go to Revelation chapter 9. We'll be at verse 1. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth trumpet. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star falling from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions. There there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon. But in Greek, I want you to remember this, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. Again, he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Ooh, what a great time to be alive here, isn't it? My goodness, can you imagine seeing this right before your face? And again, it, this seems like thousands of years away, doesn't it? But we know, according to Scripture, especially what Jesus was saying, the hour is at hand, guys. It is so very close to see this. And again, we hear about these locusts and and horse-like creatures and all this and that, and it seems very sci-fi. But when we begin to use Scripture to understand Scripture and look at the times we're in right now, things are going to begin to come a little bit more in focus. Now, are we going to understand every single detail of this? Absolutely not. It's impossible. But what we're going to do, again, we're going to look at Scripture. We're going to look at some of the times that we're in right now, and it's going to bring an eerie similarity at the end of this, I do believe. So let's start back at verse 1 and really just dissect this. 
So again, it says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So as we saw in uh, a previous trumpet, there was a star, and we figured out it was probably a meteorite and all that. Well, this star, because of how it speaks right here, we know this is an literal star, but perhaps an, an angel that has descended to, um, to the earth like a falling star, and, and possibly old Satan himself. So one thing we've got to understand is to be able to understand what this actually is saying is this. The verb fallen here that we see, it is written as a means of like having previously fallen and now being in a fallen state. So it's not as if John was in, in heaven seeing this, this star fall. This word fallen in the Greek, the way it's written, uh, perfect, participle, participle, whatever it is. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not great in English. I can barely speak English as it is. But it says, what it means, again, that it previously has fallen and now it's in a fallen state. So let's look at a couple of scriptures real quick that kind of brings us in. In Isaiah 14, 12, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. And again, of course, it's speaking about Satan. One more, Luke 10, 18 says, And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So again, it really makes sense that this is possibly Satan himself that we are seeing fallen to heaven for a particular specific purpose. Now, it says a, a key um, will be given to him. So a key shows that this area has been locked, and the one who has been given the key has been given the authority to open it. What we've got to understand is Satan does not always have this key in his possession. At a particular moment in time, for a particular purpose, this key is handed to Satan so that he can open up this bottomless pit. So what is the bottomless pit? Well, it means a couple things. In the Greek, it means the abyss. It also means a prison, which is very, very important. By understanding that, we can go back into Scripture and have a better detailed understanding of what this bottomless pit actually is. So this is actually oftentimes where demons are held, according to the Word of God. Again, 2 Peter 2, 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Also in Jude 1.6, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. What's this great day we're talking about? Well, again, it's the great day of the Lord. It's that, that very end of time when, as we know it. There was one more time when Jesus was dealing with some demons. And they begged him to not put us into the abyss or the pit. Send us into that swine, that herd of swine. And so he obliged them. He said, go ahead and go into the swine. Even the demons, guys, did not want no part of this bombless pit. How about us? Who in here wants to go to the bombless pit? How about watching on video right now? I do not know one person that wants any part of this bombless pit, especially when the demons themselves do not want no part of it. So let's go to verse 2. Verse 2 says, And he opened the bombless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Now again, every time I read scripture, I try to put myself there. I want to be able to see what's taking place. I want to be able to feel the, the atmosphere around me because it makes it more real for me. So it appears that the appearance of smoke is something important for us to see. Every minute detail that John speaks of seems like it's very important for us to take in. So where there is smoke, there's there's fire, right? And oftentimes in the Word of God, fire represents judgment. So we understand that this is a place of judgment, and the opening up of this pit is the opening of judgment upon this earth. Again, what we know as God's wrath. With enough smoke to darken the sun and the air, it appears this bottomless pit is absolutely very large. So, not saying that this is a volcano, but you ever seen pictures of volcanoes as they erupt? All that ash and smoke goes in the, the air and it blocks the sun, it blocks the moon, and it turns everything as darkness. Well, you know, it, like I said, I'm not saying this is a volcanic um, event, but what I'm saying is it's going to look a lot like a volcanic event in this, this situation. 
So again, trying to paint the scene here so we know just how dismal this time is. Quickly at verse 3. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. So I'm going to give more details in just a moment when we get to verse 7 on these uh, beautiful little creatures, I'll say. But in your handout, I made a mistake. I, uh, the, the first uh, bulletin, I said scorpions were known to fly. Uh, mark that out. I was on a bad day, evidently. Is the scorpions, I'm sorry, the locusts. The locusts were known to fly in such swarms that they could become like a cloud and darken the sun. Now over here, it might have a hard understanding that, you know, how, how can many locusts become like a cloud? Well, over in Asia and Africa, um, they swarm in millions to the point where they can look like a cloud. So these little critters are known to decimate everything and anything in their past, such as grass, crops, even varnished furniture and doorpost. There are stories where there would be varnished furniture outside, and in no time, these little critters would eat through that varnish and completely decimate that piece of furniture. It's amazing. So it is believed, though, that they are not known to eat because of their appetites, but simply for the rage to destroy things. Now, that's a lot of rage, isn't it? So this is what the Lord is trying to get us to understand. The rage behind the appetite of destruction for these these. For the demonic, I will say. Um, so, what are we talking about here? It could possibly be a reference to a demonic army who are gathering to destroy everyone and their path. And what we've got to understand is, are these actual demonic entities? Are they going to be a demonic force upon a nation or a coalition of nations' armies? Well, we're going to try to continue to look at that a little bit later on. Now, they had no power until power was given to them. Uh, locusts are not known as having strength, even in great numbers. So a power given to them is seen as granting them power beyond their capabilities or nature. As we go along this, I want you to hear very deeply about this stuff. The demons, even right now, who are affecting people walking on this earth right now, they have a limited amount of power and authority, guys. You know who's got more greater and power and authority over a demon? Yeah, those of us who are in Christ's name. He has given us all power and authority over the demonic, has he not? And so, anything we read today, should this scare us? Absolutely not. It should give us more hope, shouldn't it not? So, finally on this one, scorpion here in the Greek means to pierce and to sting. The power of the scorpion is seen in a sting which doesn't result in death that often, but can cause an unrelentless suffering. So even in today's time, we may feel that we have gone through unrelentless sufferings. But guys, our suffering today is nothing like the way it's going to be for the unsaved. Let me make sure I uh, we, we all understand that. We're talking about the unsaved here. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ, this is your future. Nothing to look forward to, is it? Look at verse 4. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So they were commanded to refrain from their nature of harming the grass and plants, but only harm those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So concerning the grass. Now if you look back at the first trumpet, we remember that, um, that a third of the trees and all green grass was destroyed. So when we see that, and again, it talks about green grass here, right? Or anything green. So does this mean that the green grass grows back? We don't know. Uh, in my mind, just me personally, we're talking about the wrath of God to come upon this earth. I don't see any life coming behind the wrath of God. So when you look at grass here in the Greek, it also means vegetation. So what I'm believing and what it means is... is Simply, they are told not to decimate any type of vegetation that is left here on earth. Why? Because that is not their agenda. That is the, the natural locust agenda, to, to just decimate any type of, of vegetation. But these particular type of locusts, that is not their agenda. It is to truly and just simply and solely um, bring unrelentless harm upon people without actually killing them. So... 
Um, again, though, I want you to hear this. This is yet another example of how God protects those who trust in Him. Yet bring in chastisement on those who refuse to call Him Lord, not out of punishment, but to draw them unto Him. That if, if He would bring such destruction upon someone, it should be our natural nature to turn to Him and not against Him. Now I want you to think about this for a Imagine yourself being there, you've seen these scorpion-like creatures like locusts coming after people and harming them, but not to death. And on relentless, just, I can't even put it in words, right? Now, on one side of it, you've seen the, the protection of God on your life. And you're praising God for it, but you see the unrelentless pain that the unbelievers are going through. Imagine the terror in your heart. You're so thankful that God's protecting you at the same time. You see the pain that others go through. And you want them just to snap out of their delusion and their, their unawakenedness and, and to wake up and, and, and go after God. But they just choose not to. We will see throughout the next chapters, they refuse to repent isn't that kind of like how it is today? You see the blessings of God in your life, and you see those that God just wants to truly bless, but they just will not turn unto Him. And they go through pain after pain after pain that you know God wants to comfort them and, and deliver them from, but yet they just will not repent and turn unto God. And this is just in, in peacetime, as we used to call it the military. We are in peacetime right now, guys. Imagine what this takes place, the unrelentless pain that people will go through. Verse 5, And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. So again, they do not have total and complete authority, meaning that God still has complete control over them. <laughs> Praise God. The five months here may refer to the time frame of how long this particular trumpet of judgment lasts before the sixth trumpet sounds. Again, it doesn't explain any time frame, but possibly that's what it means for five months before the, the next one sounds. Verse 6, In those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Um, so this past week I've had to go back over several times and, and change my handout from where I started at to where we are at today, and I probably will continue to change it. But when I read this in general, personally, and this is what I wrote in the handout, it, it's, it may sound like those who wish to die because of the torment are unable to, as if the power of suicide is taken away from that person. Now imagine a time like that, right? When you want to die, but the power of suicide is taken from you. And I thought, well, that's, that's pretty horrific. But the Lord gave me a deeper revelation that is even worse. So it's very possible that it means that those who wish to die in order to escape the torment won't be able to escape the torment even in death because eternal torment awaits them because they did not turn to Christ. That they want to die here and even though they could take their own lives, the torment does not stop but it actually gets worse because it will never ever end. I don't know about you, but that does not sound like fun for me. That is absolutely a horrific thought. So, we're at verse 7. We're moving right along. Everybody staying up to date? Everything good? Okay. So, verse 7. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. So, eight times... The word like is used to mean that it wasn't to be taken literal, but it was in regards to the likeness of. So let's take a look at what this pretty little devil looks like. Well, he's a cute little thing, isn't he? This is an artist's rendition of exactly of how the scripture um, explains in detail what this, this little guy looks like. Again, looks like a locust, scorpion tail. Hair of a woman, gold crown, teeth of a lion. And as you see, his chest is like that, impen I can't ever say that, impenetrable armor. You know what I'm talking about. So let's, let's take a look at this guy and, and let's keep that in the back of your mind. Imagine that thing coming at you. Yeah, we're not talking one. Not one. We're talking an army of these things coming at you. And, and you don't even have to worry about its, its teeth. Is that tail? 
continually striking you, but you cannot die. You cannot escape that. And then imagine, this is, let's, let's say this, looks, this is what a demonic entity looks like, at least this particular type, right? Now, when you die, you think, well, at least I get to escape that. Guess where he gets to go? If you do not believe in Christ, he's going to go with you in the lake of fire forever. You will always have to look at that thing. Instead of looking at our Savior, our peace, our, our God, our, our God of forgiveness and love, mercy. Which one do we choose today, guys? It's crazy. So what I want you to do, let's look at Joel. I, uh, I was going back and forth about where to go with this, but I want you to go to uh, the book of Joel. If you go to, you'll see Jeremiah, then you'll see Ezekiel, then you'll see Daniel, and then right after Daniel is Hosea. Right after Hosea is the book of Joel. Uh, the book of Joel really goes into deep um, detail of these end times. Um, the first one is not going to be up here. There's just going to be one scripture uh, that I just want to explain again how the Word of God explains these locusts. And then we will actually go into the book uh, Joel 2 to go a little bit deeper. So Joel chapter 1. Verse 4, and it says this, What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Is there anything left in this path? I mean, it pretty well cleans up after itself, does it not? So, a again, we're not talking about physical... Um, shrubbery and, and vegetation, this represents someone's life, where absolutely everything is removed out of it, or not even removed, is destroyed out of it, right? And this is what these demons are doing, completely just destroying everything on their path. John 10.10, 10, the enemy comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. I think that is a beautiful picture. I don't want to use the word beautiful, but I think this is a, a great picture of John 10.10 10 of what the enemy does in someone's life who does not choose the Lord. So now, up here and, and there, go to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. And I want you to look at verse 1. Again, this is going to pretty well explain everything that uh, what Revelation is talking about. It says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Joel chapter, I don't know if I told you, verse 1. Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, a people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successful generations. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like swift steeds, so they run. With a noise like chariots over mountaintops, they leap. Like the noise of a flaming fire that devours a stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. Before them, the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation, and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before his army for his Camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? So we won't go on, but if you look at your next heading, it says a call to repentance. And this is where Joel was coming to, was calling people into repentance so they would not have to face such a, a time such as this. So 
uh, to go a little bit further, as you see in your handout, the horse uh, that is shaped or prepared for battle is focused and prepared in obedience to the rider. They are strong and courageous. So if you've ever seen a, a horse in battle, that's how they act. They're, they're focused on one thing and that agenda alone. The crowns here of gold, they represent victory. Again, these aren't the, the diadema type of, of crowns that represent royalty. These are the ones that represent victory. And so it shows that they have, well, that picture, they had crowns of gold, meaning that they would be victorious in their agenda or their purpose here on earth. It says their faces were not like creatures, such as a locust or a horse, but that of a human being. All right, let's go a little bit further. Verse 8, back in Revelation 9, verse 8. Again, we're going quick, but I hope it's making sense. But here in just a moment, I'll be bringing some pretty nifty things. It says, They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. In order to understand what John is talking about here, it's important that we go back to history of, of how he knew um, the, the warriors would look. And it was very uncommon for men's hair to be long at all. It was normally very, very, very short. So for John to see this, this type of army with long hair, it took him by surprise. So therefore, that's why he, he wrote it down. The lion's teeth is in reference to Joel 1.6. It says, For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. This represents how they are able to rip anything in their path to shreds. You ever see how a, a, a lion will frenzy upon something, uh, upon their predator that's, or their prey? That's uh, how this, uh, this demonic army will be. So finally, here we go, verse 9. We only have a couple left, but this is their, the deep one right here. It says, And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. So, simply enough, breastplates of iron refers to how impenetrable they are. It's been documented that locusts can be heard up to a mile and a half away. So, imagine this great number, um, amount of locusts, how astonishing it would sound. It'd be crazy to hear that. So, some consider this to be a picture of a great nation's army with helicopter gunships hovering overhead. And as possible, this may actually be, considering John would have never seen anything like that in his time. So again, when John is seeing this vision, we've got to understand something. He's trying to describe something that he may have never, ever seen before. So imagine a man that lived 2,000 years ago trying to describe to you what a helicopter looks like. Just, I mean, it's going to be almost impossible, right? So we've got to ask ourselves this question. Is this a description of a demonic entity or entities, or is this a description of a nation's army that is being controlled by the demonic? So, again, all this sounds so sci-fi, right? Like, you know, almost out of grasp, out of mind, because, you know, again, it seems just so far-fetched, right? But I want to share with you some things that has happened recently in our time frame that is very eerily similar to what we just read in Revelation 9. So in 2015, the Navy came out with a new defense um, uh, program. I'll just, I'll just call it a defense program. And the name of this defense program was called Low Cost UAV Swarming Technology. I'll say it again in case you want to write it down. It was called Low Cost UAV Swarming Technology. And as everything in the military, we use acronyms for absolutely everything. All right? The, an acronym is used absolutely for absolutely everything. So when you take a look at the acronym, right, what possibly could it be? Well, low, you got L O, right? Cost, you got the C. UAV, they take the U. Swarming, they take the S, and technology, they take the T. What does that spell? Locust. It's actually called the Locust Program that deals with drones. That's a little eerie, isn't it? So all these drones are actually called Locust in the Navy. Now, let's, let's go a little bit further. Let's bring it home a little bit, shall we? Can we bring this home a little bit further? 
a little bit more. So in 2020, in our backyard, my old stomping grounds of Eglin Air Force Base, there is an exercise. It was actually called the Unmanned Aerial System Exercise. And it consisted of the 96th Cyber Test Group, the 46 test squadrons, I'll tell you what their test team's name is in just a moment. Uh, it was provided by live fire from the 780th test squadron. It conducted 431 UAS sorties, which is again, unmanned aerial system sorties. If you never heard of a sortie before, this is what a sortie is. It's a deployment from a defense position against the enemy. So, the, um, the name of this exercise was called Apollyon. The name of the exercise at Eglin Air Force Base in 2020 was called Apollyon, and it consisted of drones that they refer to as locusts. Now, how far-fetched does this sound now? Now, again, what I said from the very beginning comes into play here. The military, no matter how strong and powerful, will a military be able to become against a spiritual force? Absolutely not. No matter how much firepower a military has, it will never be able to take out a spiritual force. Guess who is the only one that, that can do that? God himself and those of us who believe in God. So I, the Lord gave this to me this morning. On Friday, I was like, Lord, we're not done with this. I don't know what else you want me to say, but I just feel that like this is un, unleft or, or just undone. And this morning, he said, I want you to look up locusts. I'm like, what? What do you mean? Look? And so, of course, there are all these, these species. And then one said the Navy locust. I'm like, Navy locust? And then guys, that went from there. So, again, is it coincidence? It was someone on Eglin going, you know, I read Revelation 9 and mentioned Apollyon, and I think we ought to name this exercise Apollyon. Or is this simply signs of the fulfillment of prophecy? All right, so let's finish it up. That was, that was the big reveal. So we only have a couple more. Verse 10 says, They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months Power in the Greek means the right that was given to them, meaning authority. I want you to understand something. You cannot exercise power without the authority given. Has Jesus given us authority? He sure has. So he has given us all authority, has he not? Meaning that he has given us all power as well. You do not exercise power till you receive the authority to exercise it. He has given us the authority to exercise all power in our lives. Since this is a repetition of verse 5, it seems quite important to take notice of this, isn't it? It's very important that John repeats this thing. And again, if this was a nation's army or coalition, then more than likely they would completely decimate the people instead of just merely hurt them for five months. So let's, let's finish this thing up. Verse 11, And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. So locusts do not have kings over them. I mean, that should be pretty self-explanatory, right? But you know, the Word of God actually says that to the T. Proverbs thirty twenty seven: the locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. The Word of God has absolutely every detail given. In it, I find that very amazing. He wants us to research his own word to understand what his word is telling us in Revelation. So this king is not believed to be Satan himself. Why? Well, we saw that, you know, verse 1, Satan fell like lightning from heaven. But again, Ephesians 2, 2 says, The prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. His Power of realm of rain is the, the air, if you will, the atmosphere, the earth. He roams around like a lion who may, may devour. But this is separate. This is a, a particular angel over the bottomless pit at this point. We know it's not the, the Antichrist or the beast. 
Because in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, it says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first, which is apostasy. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, which is the Antichrist. It means that he is a man, right? So Satan is not the, the, uh, the leader or the, the king over Abaddon. It's going to be something else. It is not the Antichrist, because the Antichrist is a man and not an angel. So it's very, very, very likely that this is speaking of yet another demonic angel. Again, the enemy, or Satan, tries to do everything contradictory of what God does, right? If you think about it, in these end times, they talk about Satan. What else do they talk about? Mark of the beast. And who else is going to be with them? The false prophet. The three. Don't we call that a trinity? Again, everything it tries to mimic or mirror what God is. We know God is a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The enemy in the end times will also try to deceive others as a false uh, trinity, if you will. Um, I want you to think about this. Here it says that he is king over them, right? He is king over them at this point. He may be king over the bottomless pit for now, but he will be stripped of all power and authority when he is thrown into the lake of fire with Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet. And finally, Abaddon and Apollyon both mean destroyer in Hebrew and Greek. It's pretty amazing that the, the same name is exactly the same both in Hebrew and in Greek. And so this is exactly what it's, it's talking about. Is that, uh, and they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is Destroyer. And so our last one, guys. Thank you for being patient with me. It says, one woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Again, we talked about last week, a woe in Greek means great grief. This alludes to the fact that the grief and destruction of the entire seven seals and the previous four trumpets are nothing compared to the grief and destruction of this fifth trumpet. I want you to think about that. Having to go through all seven seals, first four trumpets, and what you thought was Hell on earth. Hell is about to be opened upon earth. Here it says, one woe is past. In Greek, it means to go off, meaning not necessarily it has ended, but it's just come to pass. And again, two more woes or times of great grief are coming shortly. So, again, thank you for your time, your patience with me. That was a lot. I understand that was a lot. It's going to be one of those you need to go back and, and look over again. A lot of information was given. But I want you to understand something. Everything we talk about today is not far-fetched. It is not sci-fi. Uh, as a matter of fact, looking at the news, look how closely related it actually is. Again, the, the Navy program named Locust, that was eight years ago, guys. It's 2023 today. That was 2015. That was eight years ago. How much closer are we? 2020. Uh, two and a half years. I think that was the 25th of September when the exercise went for 10 days or whatever. That was almost three years ago when they had this exercise named Apollyon. So it's very real. What we're reading today is absolutely very true. It's going to happen. And I don't want anyone to have to face that. And all we've got to do is call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we will be saved and away from this stuff. Amen.